Welcome to Journaling with Nature, the podcast for those who want to turn curiosity into wonder, a pencil sketch into a rabbit hole of discovery, a moment of stillness into a life full of joy. I'm your host, Bethan Burton. Let's open the pages of our nature journals and explore this world together. Hello, this is episode 13. Today, my guest is Robin Carlson a biologist and natural science illustrator who has a deep interest in documenting how landscapes and ecological communities change over time. In particular, her work focuses on fire ecology and how habitats regenerate after fire. She comes from California, where fire is a part of life and a part of nature. I'm really interested in this because in Australia, fire is a part of our ecological systems as well. Listen to find out more about fire ecology and the historical parallels between fire management practices in the USA and Australia. Robin, thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is such a thrill and an honor. I'm so glad to be here. I have been um, hanging on to the idea of chatting to you about your your work and your projects because they are just super interesting. You wrote a, a blog post for International Nature Journaling Week, and it actually informed. Uh, it actually was part of the reason why I started this podcast because it was just so interesting, and I wanted to know more. So I'm excited to have this chance today. <laughs> that is so great to hear. I am. Um, I mean, I'm so excited to talk to people about what I've been learning because yeah. it's so interesting and it's just yeah. really great to have these opportunities to share yeah. it with people. That's awesome. So you are a natural science illustrator, but in your previous career, you were a biologist and you were studying restoration of stream habitats for salmon populations. How did this transition happen? How did you go from being a scientist to a natural science illustrator? Yeah, so I was absolutely certain growing up my entire childhood that I was going to be a scientist, almost always a biologist, although Mm -hmm. the focus changed a bunch, but I was positive I was going to be a scientist. Um, But I always did art at the same time. And my attitude through my whole childhood was I've got to do the art as much as possible now because I'm going to be a very serious scientist when I grow up and I probably won't have, (laughs) you know, I won't have enough time to do all the art I want to. So now's my chance. And so I did summer art programs, just, you know, did as much of it as possible while also still, you know, paying attention to, Mm. to biology and my other interests. And so I followed that path and I, um, you know, was on the path to being an academic scientist. I was in a PhD program and I was studying evolutionary biology. I've always been interested in how systems change over time. And so that was what I was interested in then too. And so I was going to get a PhD in evolutionary biology. Um, But as, you know, as I started that program, I realized that while I loved everything I was learning about, I didn't want to have to focus so completely on one specialized area. And then what I really liked was the big picture and being able to learn about so many different topics um, in evolutionary biology at that point, but also in biology more more holistically. And so I got a master's and I left. And then I did have a fairly long (laughs) career um, related to stream habitat work, although I was not actually doing the the ecosystem work. I was managing Mm -hmm. data and reporting and monitoring and um, thinking a lot about communication um, of all of these scientific concepts and of communicating the ecosystem change that we were you know, that essentially the programs that I was working with were were making happen through their restoration projects. And I more and more thought, you know, maybe I could actually accomplish some of these same goals with art. Mm -hmm. What Mm -hmm. I really want to do is communicate science and I want to communicate what's going on in the world to other people. And data and reports are a nice way to do that. But, you know, maybe there's a way also to um, be able to do the, you know, all of this artwork that I enjoy um, in a way that I feel like is a satisfying connection to the science and a satisfying way to really actually spread the information that I want to spread. Yes. And so that was what made me eventually decide that um, I was going to actually give it a try to being a science illustrator, um, even though it felt like a, a 
fairly terrifying a leap. <laughs> leap. Yes. Did you just leap? Did you just start and and it grew from there? Did you just take the leap? Yeah, I mean it was it was a slow <laughs> a fairly <Yeah>. slow leap. <laughs> um I was in a position with my employer um with the restoration work where I sort of slowly did you know, fewer and fewer hours per week of that work. Yep. And I had sort of made some connections through that, um, that I had done some artwork along the way in that subject area and with some of the agencies that I'd been working with. And so it was, it was a bit of a gradual <laughs> transition. <laughs> um, but then I finally said, okay, I'm ready to, <laughs> yeah. to completely quit doing this other work and see where I can take this. And you've taken it far because you've done a lot of um, interpretive signage and that sort of thing, haven't you? It must be so gratifying to see your your work out there in the in the wild. Yeah, that was that was pretty amazing. I the interpretive signage that I did, um, the largest project I did was also essentially the first project that I did yeah. and so it was pretty amazing to go down there and actually see them up and it was at a grand yeah. opening and so I was able to sort of lurk and listen to other people talking <laughs> about it and engaging with it and so that was a pretty amazing experience. That's so cool. I love I, I love stories of people living their passions and so that you had this passion for art and you've combined it with your um, love of science and that you're using art as a method of science communication, I think is really powerful. And so you, five years ago, you were looking out for a project to study and you wanted to study the changes in nature over time. And then this huge wildfire happened and it burned a natural reserve near you. And that was Stebbins Cold Canyon Reserve. Can you talk about this big event? Yeah. So in light of this past summer and really the few summers before that too, the fire was actually not that big, okay. um, considerably smaller than what just mm. burned that same area again now. Um, but still, it it was a big enough fire that it burned, you know, completely burned the um, this natural reserve and the area around it. Um, and I was sort of paying attention to it the way I was ordinarily paying attention to fires, which is, oh, it's another fire. Well, it's summer yes. and, you know. Um, and then when I realized that the reserve had burned, I thought, oh, what a horrible shame. That's really sad. It's such a beautiful area and I've hiked there so many times and, you know, it's it's a tragedy, which is what, uh, you know, our totally normal and understandable reaction to yeah. fire is. Yeah. Um, but then it sort of slowly occurred to me afterwards that, whoa, this is open to the public. <laughs> um, I mean, it wasn't actually open to the public for a little while after the fire, but it, you know, was eventually going yeah. to be open to the public again. And I thought this could be an amazing opportunity to um, see what happens after a mm. fire. Here's this, you know, this common natural disturbance that I've got a very stark starting point. Um, yes. And I, you know, I find myself with with the opportunity to actually spend some time there. And so it just turned out to be just just a wonderful, perfect timing um, that that happened. And then, you know, I very quickly began to realize that, you know, it wasn't a tragedy. I mean, and not because yes. I had the opportunity to study it, but because mm. wildfires like that one, especially, I mean, it's, it's not a tragedy. That reserve it's had not burned part. for 30 years. Yeah. Um, that's within a fairly normal, natural burning um, regime for that kind, the kinds of habitat that are there. And this is a, you know, this is a healthy part of the ecosystem. So. And so what did Stebbins Canyon look like at its peak right before the, um, right before the fire? Because you said you'd been there recreationally before. So, and after 30 years of growth, what, what does it what did it look like right before the fire yeah so it's a it's a it's a fantastic place to do this kind of study because it has a, a number of different habitats um, mm. it's a canyon oriented um, north south with fairly steep sides um, and and the sort of the steepness and the height of the mountains on either side um, have meant that there are five really different habitats there. So there's chaparral wow. and there are, there's riparian. Um, there are blue oak woodlands. Um, mm. There's sort of an oak savanna. And then there are also grasslands there. And so it's wow. this amazing it's really mixture. Diverse. Yeah. Of, of different habitats. Um, 
And so before the fire, there were um, three main trees that dominated the canyon, two kinds of oak, blue oaks and um, interior live oaks, and then also gray pines. Um, and then tons and tons of different shrubs that characterize the chaparral um, and a, a seasonal stream that runs down the middle of it. So it goes completely dry in parts of it most summers. And it, because it had been 30 years, it had was, you know, reaching sort of the climax of the succession mm -hmm. of these different habitats. And so their shrub cover was pretty thick and complete and there were lots of mature trees and um, that meant relatively fewer wildflowers because the um, canopy was dense enough that there wasn't as much sunlight reaching the ground. So, you know, some of the smaller plants that required more light were less abundant at that point. Um, so. Mm. And then the fire came through and it was the whole the whole place was changed and you were there how long until they opened up the reserve that you were able to look around yeah so i went up oh a monthish after the fire to look in from yep. the highway <laughs> just to get an idea of what it looked like and i didn't yep. go in then because it was closed um but then they offered some um guided hikes by reserve staff the fire happened in um July into August. Um, in December, I went on a guided hike and then I asked, um, you know, I explained the project that I wanted to do and asked if there was any way I could have access to the canyon because researchers were going in to continue their research projects. And so um, I started, I, so they granted me that permission, and I started going in um, in January. So that was four or five months after the fire. Um, mm -hmm. And then the reserve opened to the public, I believe that May. So there was a little bit of time when I was going in and there wasn't, <laughs> there weren't very many other people who were going yes. in at that time. And it was very interesting to also, it's a very popular place. Uh, people, okay. it gets full of hikers. And so it was a very interesting experience to be there when it was so calm and quiet yeah. too. Yeah. And what did you notice in the very beginning when you first started going in? What were the first signs of life that you noticed after the fire? Yeah. So when I went there for the guided hike in December, um, it was long enough after the fire that um, we, there'd been some rainfall. Um, and so there were absolutely plants responding um, and had been for a while. The, the shrubs there especially start re-spreading from their bases, the ones that are able to do that immediately. And they'd been doing that for a while. So there was some okay. pretty decent new green growth um, coming from the bases of, of a lot of the shrubs um, there. And then the uh, sort of other noticeable green <laughs> showing up at that point was soap plant, um, which resprouts from um, rhizomes underground um, pretty immediately after fire too. And so it had some nice, big, long green leaves coming up. Is that a fire adaptation? Well, it's a disturbance adaptation. I mean, that definitely okay. is a fire response, but I don't, it's mm. probably not just it that resprouting doesn't require fire to do that. Okay. They can resprout yeah. from their rhizomes under other conditions as well. Yeah. Um, but I believe that fire does help stimulate more um, seed germination. So they do start, mm. new seeds start germinating after fire. And I believe that that is, um, you know, partly uh, intensified by fire. So they start both at once. So you're not going to see the um, new plants that are coming up from seeds right away after fire like that. So you know that yeah. that first growth is coming up from the rhizomes. I'm so interested in that because in Australia, there are um, fire is a huge part of our ecology too. And there are particular plants that that have to have fire for them to split open the seed case and uh, um, some species of eucalyptus and banksia. Are there plants that are occurring in Stebbins that um, that actually require fire to open the seed case? Uh, so the main one that I know of, there's a wildflower called Whispering Bells that only appears at Stebbins after fire. Um, okay. It had not been seen there in the intervening 30 years since the previous fire, but it wow. showed up um, showed up right away after the fire. And then I think by the second or the third year it was really abundant. And then disappeared again. <laughs> and so it does require the nitrogen from the smoke um, to start to germinate. 
Oh, well, this is so interesting from an ecology point of view that uh, I was reading up about it in preparation for talking with you and I learned about um, the term pyrophytes, which is like plants that are adapted to fire. And they, and I was reading that there's passive pyrophytes, which are like fire-resistant species that can resist a small fire. And then there are um, active pyrophytes, which, such as eucalyptus here in Australia, that actually encourage the spread of fire, which is so fascinating. Yes. Eucalyptus are very cool. <laughs> Incidentally, very destructive, but very cool that they have <laughs> they've evolved those strategies yeah, of yeah. becoming explosively uh, burning. I, I don't know if you know this, but and I just learned about it fairly recently, but in Australia there's some birds of prey that actively spread fire. Yeah, I had read about that. Yeah, they pick up burning twigs and they from an existing fire and they move it to a new location to create another fire. And the idea is to flush out the the prey, the small um, mammals or reptiles or something. But uh, they call them f- uh, fire foraging raptors, which is just so incredible. This is the sort of like new to Western science. Like um, ornithologists are just sort of studying it now, but it's been uh, known by uh, Indigenous Australians for years that that the birds do this and. Um, I just find it super interesting. Like any crazy adaptation that can exist seem to exist. <laughs> yes. yes. Has, this, has this sort of behavior been observed where you are? I am not aware of any mm-hmm. observations of that here at all. But it certainly seems like, especially with birds, the more we're willing to open our eyes to yes. things that to behaviors that birds are capable of, the more we're able to find. Um, but yeah, yeah, but no, I'm not aware of that from California. I loved hearing that. That was just <laughs> so wild. <laughs> I, I yeah, I, I'm constantly fascinated by nature and how, like you say, it's so it's infinitely more complicated than we're even willing to to admit, and. <laughs> Yeah, super interesting. I'd love for you to talk a little bit about ecological succession because this might not be um, something that listeners are familiar with, but the idea that a certain group of species appear in the beginning and then they change over time and it becomes, like you say, a climax community uh, towards a, the end of that of that period. Yeah, so I'll use the the sort of the succession of, of habitats at um, Cold Canyon at Stebbins, excuse me, um, as an example because it's a it's a good way to illustrate it. So, right after the fire, um, all of the uh, canopy overhead is essentially gone. I mean, it depending on the severity of the fire, and the fire five years ago was not so severe that there was not still some canopy in some places, but okay. there were huge amounts of ground just completely opened up again. Um, Mm. And that is an enormous change from what the habitat had been right before the fire. And so what that means is there are tons of, we'll start with plants, (laughs) plants that have opportunities that they haven't had for 30 years. um, And many of them have been growing in the canyon the whole time. They're not like whispering bells. They haven't disappeared. Um, They're hanging on, but they're hanging on in the spots where light is still reaching the ground Mm. in enough um, quantity that they're getting their needs met um, growing up each year. And so a lot of these are annuals. Um, They're not necessarily all, but a lot of them are annuals that require a huge amount of light and that often have really beautiful showy wildflowers. And so that is why, um, you know, there's this big expectation that after a fire, you're going to get a few years of amazing wildflowers because they're getting light that they haven't gotten in a really long time. And so they're the first things to show up um, Mm. plant-wise after the fire. Um, Them, and then also, like I mentioned, the re-spreading shrubs. So the shrubs are starting to come back right away. Um, Some of the shrubs have the ability to re-sprout immediately from their from their roots, from or from burls at the base of their um, trunks. And so they're sprouting and growing again. Um, Other shrubs do have to regrow from seeds, but that does start immediately. It just takes longer to show up above Mm -hmm. ground. Um, And the other thing that I found interesting was uh, vines uh, come back right away. And so there's all this green that shows up that you're looking up the hillside and thinking, oh, look at all those shrubs regrowing. And then you realize, no, (laughs) it's vines that are so excited to have the light. And then also Mm -hmm. the substrate of all the bare burned branches are fantastic for vines to grow up on. And they weren't able to do that in quite that abundance because they didn't have the light they were shaded out and it was harder to compete with the leaves that were growing on all those shrubs Mm. before so there's all these huge opportunities right after the fire and so that lasts for the first two or three years after the fire and then as 
time passes, um, some of the larger, more woody plants are have had time to regrow too. And so these are things, things like chaparral currant and some some sages and some other things that aren't quite as substantial as the shrubs, um, but are larger and, and hardier than the annual wildflowers. And so those start showing up and flowering. Um, some of them, again, are heavily spreaded from bases, and a lot of them are growing from seeds. Um, and so those appear, you know, starting in the third and the fourth years. Um, and all that time, the shrubs and the trees are growing. And so by about 10 years, at least, so the example I'm giving is, is fairly specific to chaparral habitat in terms mm -hmm. of timing. But by about 10 years after a, the fire, the shrubs that were there um, before the fire have had a chance to get near the height that they were pre-fire. And once they've done that, they're starting to really fill in the canopy and that's really shading out the wildflowers. So a lot of those abundant wildflowers have gone back to their <laughs> more diminished numbers. Um, and things are sort of balancing out where some of these sort of intermediate sub-shrub types are also still there, but maybe not quite as dominant as they were in the um, intervening time between when the wildflowers were dominant and then when the shrubs and the trees have come back to to their dominance. And what's fascinating is then all of the, um, the animals and fungi that are dependent and lichens that are dependent on all of these plants, the composition of they, them changes too. So there's a fascinating um, change in mouse populations in chaparral ah. where there's one kind of mouse that is really common right after a fire because they are um, their main food sources are all of these annual plants that are springing up right after the fire and then as those get replaced that mouse gets replaced by a different mouse and then as those intermediate plants get replaced then there's actually a different mouse that becomes more common um, and then it's also sort of the same principle with um, birds either because of the plants that they're relying on or how much cover that they require. So plants that require yes, okay. huge amounts of cover like quail don't show up right away in the burned areas because there's just nowhere for them to hide and that they're totally dependent on that. And so you don't see them in, in great numbers until the shrubs have started to fill back in. So there's just so many fascinating things that all work together hand in hand. Mm. Everything's working together and yet the whole system is in is dynamic. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting about the the mammals and and the plants being in being in sync. So you uh, s soon after the fire, you started your um, blog, and the blog's called Wildfire to Wildflowers, and you document the whole process there. And it's such a, an amazing blog. I'll link to to it in the show notes for this episode. Um, can you tell me about writing the blog? Did you have the idea that you would keep a blog when you first started, or did it D develop just because you wanted to keep a record of what you were seeing? Yeah, so one of the main reasons that I started doing this, aside from just personal curiosity and interest, was yeah. because I was um, at that point planning to transition into doing um, science illustration. I really needed a reason to keep doing art all the time and then also a sort of a focus for it and then also a way to point to it when I was looking for work and trying to explain to yeah. people what I do and also what I'm interested in, what I like to do. So so doing the blog was um, definitely a part of the plan from the beginning as just a way to have yeah. a presence <laughs> online yeah. that I could send people to as an example of, of what I do. Um, and it was definitely not particularly intended as much of a writing exercise. I have mostly written fairly minimally on it and have mostly used it as a way to post the images. Um, yep. But um, definitely did want to have a way to talk through, you know, some of the ideas of what I was seeing um, as yeah. well. It's such a, in a, I mean, you've got so many months now because you've been doing this program, this um, project for for five years and so the blog is really rich it's an amazing thing to explore I'm interested in knowing what your process is while you're documenting the changes at Stebbins do do you do most of your work in the field or do you take photos and work from home or do you do a combination of both uh, very much a combination of both I um yep. I I'm always <laughs> up there feeling like there's so many things I want to capture and there's not enough time to capture it all. And I try to, um, especially after 
you know, the first year or so when I was wide eyed and really trying to capture everything. I do try to have some mm. focus when I go, which helps with that. But um, <laughs> it does mean that while I do as much drawing as I can when I'm there, I am also taking pictures the entire time and knowing yeah. that there are things that I am still planning to capture in images that I am just not going to have time to do. And I and I often don't do color while I'm there because I'm yeah. it's more important to me to capture, you know, first impressions of what things look like and then move on <laughs> yeah. and capture more and then add color at home. And I um, was intentionally keeping photo documentation both to work from at home but also just so I would have it um you know in case I had questions and wanted to go back and see what things look like um and these are all just you know not very good snapshots on a, on a phone but I was sure glad when I came up with the idea for the wild wonder um workshop that sure glad that I had all of that documentation. Um, yes. And there have been things that I have gone back and seen in photos, things that I didn't notice at the time, seen, oh my goodness, <laughs> that flower was there and I wasn't focusing yeah. on it, but there it is in the background and I didn't even know it showed up that first year or something like that. Yeah, that's so interesting. That Oh, it's great to use both. I think that um, photography um, is a really powerful tool and you can use that in your nature journaling to to great benefit and that sounds like that's what you're doing it sounds like the the area is is a bit of a hub for research I'm interested in like do you collect data as such or is it more images it sounds like people are already doing scientific research there so yeah so because it's part of the University of California natural reserve system it is definitely an active research um, site uh, and I mean in, in some ways it's a little bit unique in how open it is to the public and how accessible it is and how well used it is by researchers. So there are a bunch of research projects going on there all the time. And in fact, there was a dramatic rescue of some, um, there was a mammal study going on uh, during the fire five years ago. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, there were mammals that were temporarily in cages because of something that oh, yeah. was being studied. And so there was this dramatic yeah. rescue oh, where wow. they got them out ahead of the fire because, of course, they didn't have the opportunity oh, wow. to use their natural uh, escape or yes. hiding or burrowing um, defenses. So that was exciting. <laughs> That's very admirable of the research. Yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, Wow. So you talk about eco-reportage and in your article for International Nature Journaling Week, you define eco-reportage as close observation of the environment at a specific place and time, repeatedly returning to build a picture of ecological change. And you say that you see this work as a kind of journalism and it requires you to understand your subject's past and ask probing questions about what it looks like now and compile detailed, a detailed picture that you return to again and again over the years. I, I love this term. Did you come up with this term, eco-reportage? Um, at least if in this usage, yes. Um, yeah. I, there's been, I'm pretty sure that in French language journalism, mm. there's been some environmental reporting referred to that way. Okay. Um, but, but yeah, I haven't really seen anyone else using it for this specific um, meaning. And I, so it was something that I was, very interested in doing um, before I started the Stebbins project. And that was one of the reasons this was appealing because it seemed like a really good way to focus on what I had been sort of eager to explore for a while. Um, yeah. And that is the, the sort of power that we have as individuals in picking any place. I mean, mm. absolutely any place um, that, you know, our home, right? Exactly where our house is, for example, mm. or somewhere nearby that's a beautiful natural area. But it, I mean, it could be absolutely anywhere. And there is there is an environmental history of that location. And you yes. have the power to see what's happening there right now. Um, and to view that with the knowledge of where, you know, what has happened in that place in the past. And then you have the power then over time, um, you know, mm. in your own um sort of individual time frame to see how things change. Um, and that's something that, I mean, I think there's an enormous power in understanding those changes yourself internally um, in a personal and emotional way. But then you 
you know, especially now with so much data at our fingertips, you can then put yes. that in this much larger context of, so, mm. you know, my house is on an area that has been agricultural land for ever and ever and ever, but of course, exactly how that, what that has looked like has changed dramatically over time. Yes. Um, and now it's a, you know, it's a suburban neighborhood and all of those things are, very interesting from an ecological point of view and you know what the land looked like in the past informs what it's like now um and what it's like now makes a big difference for what it's going to look like in the future and i i'm just really really interested in in our power to to see this for ourselves and then make that connection to a bigger picture and then we can make that connection with each other with each of our own individual experiences um and then i think that because it's very hard to do that, you know, with your own home, which seems so incredibly boring. <laughs> there are so many places that we can usually get to, not yeah. that's not very hard, that we can also do this in an area that feels more inspiring, mm. <laughs> feels mm. more natural to us, um, you know. Yeah, go ahead. I'm really interested in this. I, w I was remembering I went years ago to a, a talk at a local environment center, and it was with um, some older people who had been in the community for their whole lives. And it was talking about the the catchment, the creek that where where we were, and it was called Kabula Creek. And uh, this one man was talking about the things he'd seen in his lifetime. And so he was in his eighties, and he was talking about almost eighty years of local knowledge. And it's that local knowledge that uh, it's. I think we've lost so much. We've lost a lot because we don't value speaking with elders anymore in in this western um western culture doesn't listen to elders in the way that we need to or in the way that other cultures do and so he had this incredible amount of knowledge he had this incredible history and he was talking about the creek and what it was like when he was a 10-year-old boy exploring the creek and it was really incredible the stuff that he knew the changes he'd seen and because we've lost that communication with elders, that knowledge is lost. And it seemed like a really powerful experience to me then to sit at the feet of this man and listen to 80 years of local knowledge about this creek. And, yeah, it, it, it gave me the sense that we've lost so much. And But also just in, in thinking about your story and what you're doing and in the context of that, that we... Yeah, we've lost a lot of local knowledge, but the, the Nature Journal can be a huge and powerful tool for capturing the knowledge. And what you're doing is documenting something in incredible detail that will then be a powerful, powerful document, a powerful record for future, for future people who are interested in the changes over time. So that's a powerful thing to that a nature journal can can be used for to keep a record to keep a record for the future. Yeah, and I think it's a a really powerful potential communication tool as well. Mm -hmm. um, not that that is necessarily the reason that people are nature journaling, um, but if that is one of the goals, I think it yeah. is so incredibly powerful to not just have documented things in words, but to have those images, because I think that, um, that in a lot of ways, seeing people's sketches, not finished artwork, but seeing sketches yes. yeah. gives you a glimpse into people's minds and selves, um, in, you know, in a completely different way. Um, and you're seeing people's thought processes, how they are, how they are experiencing things themselves, I think, in yes. an incredibly direct way. And I think that the emotional impact that's possible, um, that's made possible by sharing journals is just so huge. And so, I mean, I have absolutely always been doing these journals with the idea that they were a communication tool. And again, I yes. know that that is not a lot of people's reason for nature journaling, and that's great. But I do think that there is this potential power um, yes. in using these for communication um, and, and really just sharing deeper parts of ourselves than we can um, just through talking and just through writing. Um, but the combination yes, of all of those things. Sorry, go ahead. No, I absolutely agree. I and I spoke with one of my previous guests who is a um 
a marine biologist and a science communicator, and we talked about how sometimes there's this big rift between the scientific knowledge and the ability to communicate that knowledge. And I think that using artwork, using a nature journal is it benefits science communication in such a big way because people can relate to it. If you have a scientific study that's presented in a scientific journal, there's a bit of a barrier between that knowledge and getting that knowledge out to people in a way that they can understand and, and be connected to. So I think that that as a science communication tool, it's a really powerful thing. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think images are in general and I think that, mm regular science illustrations, which are something that I also do and believe in the power of, are an important communication tool. But I do think that there's something personal <laughs> that helps, I mean, that's, that is a really important part of communication that you just don't get from finished illustrations, um, that yes. you get from seeing journals, that I think it's important to sort of recognize that and understand that that's a really important part of science communication too. Yeah, I agree. How did you come to your nature journal style? Did so you you do finished illustrations, but you also do this amazing nature journal style. And I'm wondering how you came to nature journaling in, in the style that you have now. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I I focus a lot when I'm drawing in a sketchbook and drawing in the field in capturing. I mean, I do think a lot about capturing the feeling of things because I'm what I'm wanting to do is not I'm not trying to do anything perfectly accurately um, I'm trying to much more convey the life of what I'm seeing around me and that definitely means the living things but also the life <laughs> in the rocks and the soil as well yes. and conveying some sort of um, you know sort of character of everything and so a lot of that means that I feel like my experience of drawing is a really important part of just the whole the whole experience of being there and putting that into the journal um, because I am there documenting it I'm a part of that setting as Absolutely. well um, and I mean and that's something else that I really try to keep in mind and I think is a really important part of sort of the idea of eco reportage which is if you're in this place you are changing it and it is changing yes. you and you are not mm -hmm you're not a passive observer <laughs> because there you are, you're walking on the ground, you're stepping on things. Um, and as you observe it, it is changing you and also you're there changing it. And so thinking about that and keeping that in mind as a part of the drawing means that I am, um, again, definitely focusing much more on capturing the entire feeling and, you know, sort of picking out, I'm, conveying this particular plant in this particular place and what is around it and what does that mean to me seeing it? Why am I wanting to capture it in this way? Um, and so I, I, I just, I'm always trying to sort of keep, <laughs> keep this big idea and picture of, of me and as a part of the environment and the environment as a part of me as I'm drawing mm -hmm. in a way that I'm not experiencing things at all if I'm trying to do a finished illustration. And yeah, there's real power in that, isn't it? To see yourself as an element in the ecosystem. And I think living in a modern world, we, we often forget that when we're in our homes and we don't even know what the phase of the moon is because we're always inside at night. And we for it's easy to forget that we are part of it. We are part of nature and being there and keeping that in your mind is a powerful thing. Um, yeah. And I also, that means that I'm not, I mean, so I, you know, I draw everything directly in ink because I think the experience of drawing yeah. it is the important part. And so plenty mm -hmm. of things that as I'm drawing that I'm, I'm thinking, oh, I didn't get that right. <laughs> but often it turns out that there's a whole lot more truth and honesty to those, yes. even those things that look like mistakes, um, mm -hmm. that it's absolutely worth having because that was the experience when I was mm -hmm. doing it. And I find a whole lot more in all of it in, you know, when I come back to it. Um, than if I had tried to make it seem perfect when I was yes, doing I it. Yes, I love that. I really love that. So before the fire in 2015, it had been 30 years since a, a, a burn like that, and now you say that another burn has gone through in just five years, and I'm interested to know about that in terms of the ecology of the reserve and, and what that means, what that short period in between burns means for the for the reserve so 
it's an excellent question. And I mean, you couldn't have devised a more perfect science experiment <laughs> than this. So, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it will be incredibly fascinating to get to see what happens. It's mm. such an interesting set of mixed feelings because, of course, yeah. <laughs> I'm also still sort of surprised when I have to keep reminding myself that no, I actually will not be checking up on that particular Ceanothus bush because <laughs> it's... Because it's gone. I mean, and it isn't actually, it is almost mm -hmm. certainly not gone. It will be re-sprouting. Yeah. But the one yeah. as I knew it that was sitting there that yeah. I could go back to is gone. And so mm -hmm. there's that sort of strange shock and absolutely some sadness because, of course, lots of things that I was enjoying and yeah. what felt like were my friends are gone. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I also know that it will, it will recover. Um, it is already showing amazing signs of life and that again this isn't mm -hmm. a tragedy um i mean what we certainly know that if there keep being fires at short intervals like this over time the habitats will change they will eventually yeah. turn probably more to grassland um we will um eventually probably lose especially the blue oaks um which are struggling more and more in california thanks to the changing climate um so things yes. will change if this keeps up, which <laughs> certainly it looks, looks like, like the trajectory. <laughs> um, but, you know, one fire after five years is not, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean any necessary sort of change. Um, it will be, I mean, there are some very specific questions that I, I'll find out the answers to really soon, like whispering bells. Was that too short an interval? Will mm -hmm. they come back again? Ah, or did they need more time? Um, I don't know. Um, and it'll be interesting to see that. Um, and there were some things I have access earlier <laughs> to go in after the fire this time. So I'll get to observe some of the earlier stages that I didn't observe personally oh, after yes. the first it's... fire. So that's also just a privilege. Yeah, yeah. So I've been up, I've gotten to hike through it once now um, since the fire. Oh, great. And so I'm going to go up hopefully again next week. Um, and so that, so yeah, so it's nice to fill in just some, <laughs> some gaps in what I knew from before um, by taking yeah. a look at it this early. Mm. So let's talk about climate change because <laughs> um, more frequent and more intense fires are a feature of climate change and we are only going to see this get more intense over the coming years. It's it's climate change. We have the tendency to think that it's a future event, but it, it really is here now. We're seeing changes already. Um, things are no longer predictable in the way that they were Um yeah, I don't know what my question is. Um, <laughs> what's your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, no, we're in it. This is it. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, um, no, I guess I, I don't necessarily have any wise words either. Yeah. Um, but I think that, I mean, I think that also means that this is it and it's time for us all to be paying attention. Um, I mean, things are changing really fast and yeah. we will be sorry if we're not paying attention to what things are like right now because that's changing. Yeah. <laughs> and the more that we document now and know deeply in ourselves what things are like, um, I think the more that that sort of prepares us to interpret what is coming next because, <laughs> because there's a lot of change coming. Um, and yeah. that also, you know, I think it is absolutely important that we feel motivated to do things to help um, to slow climate change. But a lot of those decisions have already been made. <laughs> we made them a long time ago and this is happening now. And there's, it, you know, we have a lot of power to, to affect how things go in the future, but the, the change has started and it's not going to stop. So. Yes, exactly. We're locked. We, our historical emissions have mean we've locked ourselves into a certain amount of change. We're seeing that change already. Um, and so, and now, I mean, yeah, you're right. We do need to focus on reducing emissions and doing what we can, but we've, we've locked it in already. And so it's going to be about adapting and right. we've got choices about how we handle it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Um, we can make a whole lot of better decisions that will yeah. affect, I mean, there will be more fires, they will be more intense, but we do have the power to change that in, in some ways. We absolutely have the, the power to potentially affect intensity and just how widespread they become. So, mm. 
Here in Australia, we have had um, some events, fire events that have just been incredibly devastating to human human life, human um, habitations. And last year, we had um, last fi- bushfire season, we had just an incredibly devastating, uh, ecologically devastating fire season. We had billions of animals lost. Some of them are thought to be extinct now, and. Um, yeah, the smoke was so intense that it travelled across and blanketed the South Island of New Zealand. It travelled across the Pacific Ocean to countries in South America. Like, the intensity of this is really unprecedented. And now it's going to be about, yeah, what do we do when this happens again? Um, you know, this is coming again because we've altered, we've altered nature, but we've also stepped away from traditional land management practices. So um, in Australia, First Nations people ha- had a way of managing land or, or country um, that was really, that that fire was an integral part of it. And so when colonisation happened and Aboriginal people were forced off the land, these managed fire management practices were excluded and really quickly the landscape changed. The, the Early accounts from settlers described it as like a parkland. They said that the landscape was like a parkland and they didn't realise that that was because it was being intricately managed. They thought it was naturally like that. And so when Aboriginal people were forced off the land, it completely changed in a really short time. And so now we have like much more uh, fuel load because the the fire has been excluded and I'm interested to know about First Nations manage, land management practices in in your area and how they are similar or different from Australia. Yeah, so it I mean it it's just about exactly the same yeah. history. I mean that down to the same descriptions by mm settlers <laughs> referring mm. to things being you know this parkland and these orchards mm. and all of this and and not not understanding at all that that was not nature How much that, the that management, was yeah. that that was tended that california was <laughs> a tended garden and the yeah. incredible diversity here was absolutely a result of that tending and right and that fire was an enormous part of that and then one of the you know, one of the tools of the genocide, in addition to removing people from their land, was criminalizing burning. Um, oh, wow. And so yep. even in the areas that <laughs> First Nations um, people were living, they couldn't burn because that mm-hmm. was criminal. Um, and so, right, and so things started changing immediately. Um, and, and right, and, and and the consequences are, I think, identical. Um, yes. And I certainly can't speak to the actual specific practices of, of burning in both places, but I mean, I think chances are it was pretty similar. I mean, yes. and so it was incredibly carefully um, timed to burn some areas on one particular schedule, you know, certain areas with certain plants and with, you know, with, of course, with the desired plant outcomes that you wanted, you would burn every year or twice a year or every five years. Um, And it was all incredibly well, (laughs) well understood, um, you know, uh, scientifically known and thought out. And this was, you know, due to huge amounts of close observation and experimentation and, um, and right. And that, you know, that California has changed in many, many different ways ways and for from many many different practices but the loss of fire has been huge and i mean and the important thing too i'm sort of guessing that the same conversation is happening in australia which is that you know people are starting to talk about there are these cultural burning practices that we should be doing and that would help and you know we've got to learn about them um and the you know the sort of the important thing to understand is that's not going to solve the problem now. I mean, that climate change <laughs> is a piece of the puzzle that means that a there is no mm. management plan that's going to solve the, the problem. But um, but the Karuk tribe here in California has pointed out that, yes, there are still going to be these mega fires. But if they had been allowed to burn the land as mm. they continue to desire to do, um, yes. it might have slowed the fire enough that there could have been 
you know, that, that intervention from firefighters could have been more effective sooner. Um, and in fact, the Karuk tribe lost um, a huge number of their own homes in one of the fires this summer. And they um, are one of the one of the tribes with one of the most active um, cultural burning programs happening. Mm. Now they've been working hard <laughs> to convince agencies in their area to allow them. And there have been, I mean, they have successfully made partnerships, but it hasn't been anywhere near on the scale that they would like it to be. Um, and they know <laughs> that the fire didn't have to do that to their home yes. and are in the position of, you know, having to watch that happen. Yes, it's a tragedy to, oh, I mean, to have this knowledge, to know how to manage this land and then to have authorities sort of stamp you out like that. Even, I mean, even now here in Australia, like um, we are going back to, um, we are recognising that, that excluding fire at all costs is is not a reasonable thing to do and that it's led to lots of damage but there is i guess there's two things there's hazard reduction burns which is um carried out by authorities and it, it, they sort of put through a fire in at at certain intervals and but it's much more aggressive even that so the 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 point of that is to reduce the fuel load but it's much less nuanced and much hotter and higher in terms of the fire than a cultural burn what i think even the terms are the same in both countries so yeah um yeah. cultural burn I, I was watching some videos about cultural burn and it's very low very cool fire and very managed very um, placing it in specific areas and the outcome is not just reducing um fuel load but there's just like br they they have the knowledge to bring back different grasses and um different important bush tucker plants and um yeah the whole thing is much more nuanced than a, than a hazard reduction burn and so i think where this knowledge is still available it's really important to to allow the the cultural burns to happen and to foster that and bring it back as much as we can because Indigenous people are the ones who know. Indigenous people are the ones who are going to be able to do what needs to be done to reduce these devastating fires. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, and the, the knowledge is and the desire are still there. I have had the, you know, enormous <laughs> privilege to witness two um, two prescribed slash cultural burns. So um, one of them was much more on the prescribed side of it, but mm -hmm. because it was a partnership between um, government agencies and the Karuk tribe, it had cultural elements to it as well and had mm -hmm. guidance from the tribe as well. And so it was still a large managed thing <laughs> with all of the government um, precautions in, in place, um, and, and they were fairly large burns. Um, and then I had the opportunity to compare that to a very, very local mm. burn that mm. was, again, it's being done at a, on the land um, of a local conservancy, um, and so they're also using it, you know, in some ways for management purposes that maybe don't make it completely just a cultural burn, but it was definitely um much more the the sort of the style and the scale of a of a an older cultural burn and it was just fascinating to see this very small low intensity fire and community members wandering around yeah. and children yeah. and everyone's just walking around poking at the fire with sticks and you could get up close and personal and see what it looks like when deer grass burns and when tule burns and um and because it's so low and so um cool it it's safe to to be there right. whereas it, I think um, with hazard reduction burns in Australia, I mean, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't have the same, right. you wouldn't have the same ability to be up close as a community. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's interesting, the history of fire management. Um, like I, I listened to a recent episode of a podcast and the podcast is called How to Save a Planet. And it's by Dr. Ayana Johnson and Alex Bloomberg. And the episode was called Fighting Fire with Fire. And they talked about why wildfires are so bad now, and it's a U.S. podcast, and they talked a bit about the history of firefighting and how the policy of fire suppression um, 
that is like immediately putting out every fire that happened even in the wilderness um, was a big thing and how this leads to just a huge build-up of unburned material and huge fires but um, yeah that 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 we have gone through this policy and realized that it's that it's not good right. is interesting and just in terms of thinking about like the history and documentation of nature and how it is now and i mean how history informs our present and how our nature journals can be a document for informing the future and i don't know just the whole the whole history of fire suppression and fire management is so interesting how we've got ourselves to where we are now Yes. which is out of control. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I mean, it's been fascinating to really and truly understand how there are many things that we do now to manage crops, <laughs> to manage land mm -hmm. in a bunch of different ways <laughs> that First Nations did um, without having to even do it in a, you know, in a manual labor or with machines like we do it now because yeah. the fire did it for them i mean having yes, this partnership yes. with fire like yeah. they did meant that there were so many um sort of <laughs> ecosystem <laughs> level changes that humanity yeah. found desirable then finds desirable now um that just happened because of fire that it's such a critical part of um I mean, part of the natural world without humans, but also part of what humans want from the natural world. I mean, we, we really did evolve with fire and it was our partner and it can do so many things that we wouldn't even need to do if we just didn't fear it <laughs> and yes. worked with it and understood that it's a partner. The, that's so interesting that you say partner because it was something that came up when I was researching that... Um, First Nations people consider it a partner right. and a friend right. and part of the system. Mm -hmm. And and Westerners or Europeans believe it to be dangerous, a tragedy, you know, the, all these words, and um, out of control. And that's just such a big difference. And, and it shows up in the way we are coexisting with fire. I mean, First Nations people coexisted beautifully with fire, used it to enhance the ecosystem, and we are still, like, in, in this situation where it's completely out of control, it's burning up houses, it's burning up, um, yeah. Yeah, we've made it so that we're right to fear it. We should fear it because yes, exactly. the way that we exist with it, it is only a terrible thing. Um, it doesn't need to be, but that's yeah. what we have made it. So I'm interested about like what what next. On the podcast, they were talking about how, you know, returning to First Nations fire management practices is going to be important. Um, managed retreat in terms of like what's coming with climate change. So like managed retreat from places where it's inappropriate to live um, because of what's coming. And rezoning, they talked about, I hadn't heard this term before, but they talked about the WUI, um, wild, Wildland Urban Interface, and how people are living now in the WUI and um, it's inappropriate in a lot of areas because your house is going to be in danger and so we have to rezone that area and make it safer and more affordable for people to live in more appropriate places. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, we talked about climate change and what's next. But I think, yeah, like we said, it, we've locked into a certain amount of um, a certain amount of heat that we're going to experience. And so it's going to be about managing in those ways. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And to come back to nature journaling, the more we each understand our own place and what it yes. was and what it is and yes. where we think it's heading um the better equipped we will be to respond yeah 100 percent. so you're focused on ecosystem dynamics after disruption and especially habitat renewal after fire but i'm really interested in other areas of disruption that might be interesting for listeners and so if someone wanted to study their own area after disruption not necessarily a fire 
I'm think I was trying to brainstorm. I was thinking like a tree falling in a forest it makes its own gap, and gap ecosystems are different from forest, you know, the rest of the forest. Or and I was thinking about locally, like what someone could do. Even like mowing your lawn is a form of disturbance, and so it, it could be interesting to to document what comes up after you mow the lawn. Or do you have any like thoughts on how people could access this sort of nature journaling, n- nature journaling after disturbance on a small home? level yeah i yeah absolutely i love the idea of looking at disturbance on all sorts of different scales because there's so much you can learn from exactly from what happens when a lawn is mowed or when a lawn Mm. is not mowed can you compare it to something that's left alone um or a lawn that's getting herbicide or fertilizer put on it and what are you not able to find in it anymore um when you Mm. go poking around deep you know you're not going to find those tiny little native snails anymore on tended lawns like that so that's an excellent example and then there are sort of intermediate types of disturbances um agricultural fields just past where i live after they're plowed what happens Mm. or as those so we're seeing more and more um fields that were growing field crops before being converted to um, orchards, almond orchards. And so what happens, that's a slightly larger change and a more permanent change. What happens when suddenly there are way, way, way more trees in the area than there were before? Mm. And what does that mean for, for example, all of the um, pests that are attracted to those trees? So all of the moths (laughs) that we have made sure are really abundant because we're giving them so much food in the form of Mm. all of these new trees. So what does that mean? And what does it mean now that there's, you know, these different fungicides and pesticides being sprayed to support those trees? And so those are all um, interesting sort of mid-level types of disturbances. Mm. Or when a new road is paved, that opens up all sorts of, of roadside (laughs) ecology to study so you know what what grows along the roadside and which of those are non-natives that are you know such lovers of disturbance but which ones are natives too that do really well in disturbance because those are also the ones that are probably doing really well after fire too Mm -hmm. Um, and we've got plenty of natives in california that love disturbance and so it's not like everything that you see by the roadside is some invasive roadsides are a wealth of amazing things to study aren't they yeah, so I, I think it's a great experiment to just think of all of the different disturbances you can find around you. Yeah. Robin, thank you so much for talking to me today. It's been absolutely amazing. You've inspired me to do more and more research on fire ecology. And, yeah, your knowledge is very deep because you've been studying this area for so long and I'm really keen to see what's next for you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation. I've had such a good time. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Robin and learning all about fire and ecological change after disturbance. You can find Robin online by going to robinleecarlson.com. From there, you'll be able to find out about her work and follow her blog, Wildfire to Wildflowers. Thank you for listening. See you next week.